Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Friday. It is the 22nd day of December, year of our Lord, 2023. I do pray this finds you well. I'm sure many of you are busy with last-minute Christmas celebration preparations. I remember my home growing up. And my parents, uh, my mom in particular, my dad worked, of course, very hard. My mom would make uh, all kinds of cookies, and spritzes were my favorite, if I recall. And uh, we'd all have to help, but you know, we'd like to help, too. And she'd make all these breads and stuff like that out of soup cans, like you know, cherry breads, and sort of like cakey, not yeast breads, but, uh, you know, like the baking soda, braised, baked breads, uh, uh, alternative leavening, I think it's called. Anyway, we'd, uh, I think I've shared this before, we'd fill up the car with, my mom would put together little plates and she'd, I mean, the whole dining room table would be covered with plates all in beautiful cellophane with a red ribbon on the top uh, tied up and filled with cookies and uh, all these breads and stuff like that. And we'd uh, uh, travel about and give them away to relatives and friends and things like that. But boy, I remember that kitchen just this night just just pumping things out just pumping things out maybe that's you i do pray it's a labor of joy for you a, a wonderful way for you to share your love if that's your talent one of the talents that the lord has given you is to cook and bake and things like that um we uh, i do like to bake and do it to cook but we have our because you know, i'm so busy on christmas we our christmas celebrations are rather subdued uh, compared to what they were in my childhood which is not a complaint actually <laughs> I kind of enjoy it as a as a, as, as a as an adult but anyway um, I'm sure you're all getting busy and I pray that your preparations would be blessed uh, don't be too stressed with the children children mind your parents a uh, lot going on so you know stress levels running high but remember what this is all about it's about the gift of the Savior God coming to us um, and a remarkable thing that is. So uh, uh, with that in mind, remember, church, church, we will celebrate the fourth Sunday in Advent at 9 o'clock Sunday morning, as we typically would. And because Christmas Eve also falls on a Sunday, not only will we celebrate the fourth Sunday in Advent, but later that day, both at 2 o'clock and 6.30 p.m., we will celebrate Christmas Eve. Same service, 2 o'clock and, and 6.30, same Christmas Eve service. The only difference being candles will be at the, it will be used at the 6.30 service. That's the candlelight service. That is, those are different services, of course, than the service at 9 o'clock, which is the fourth Sunday in Advent. Um, also, Christmas Day, the Feast and the Nativity. So if you're not traveling and uh, staying in the area, I do encourage you to come to that and invite your family to that too. Uh, it's a... Uh, we'll, we'll have divine service. We'll have communion at all those services. And uh, that is uh, um, a different service than those that are celebrated on, on Christmas Eve. The reading is from John 1 as opposed to the uh, Luke chapter 2, the typical Christmas reading, the Linus Christmas reading. Everybody knows that from a Charlie Brown Christmas. But anyway, so we have four opportunities to go to church on both between uh, Sunday morning and Monday morning. And then you can enjoy, of course, the rest of the week with your family. And then looking ahead, we'll have an extra service, of course, on New Year's Eve, which again is also Sunday. We'll have the first Sunday of Christmas at on Sunday morning, so that's the 31st. And then that evening, we'll gather to celebrate the eve of the feast and circumcision of the circumcision in the name of Jesus as we do every year on New Year's Eve. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord Almighty grants us a quiet night, the peace of the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And I'm going to return to the daily lectionary, and we are running a couple of days behind. Um, and I'm going to read tonight. We took a break last night to observe the Feast of St. Thomas. But tonight I'm going to read from Revelation chapter 7. I think we'll say goodbye to Revelation after this uh, and move into probably singing the Psalms for the day. And of course, Christmas Eve, we'll do something special uh, 
uh, and actually probably now that I think about it, probably won't have a Christmas Eve. We're just so busy. And by the time we get done, it's about this time. And everybody's been to church hopefully three times that day, so we probably won't have a prayer at the close of the day. It'll depend on what my schedule allows. And then same thing on Christmas Day. People will be with their families. I'll be busy as well. So here's Revelation chapter, and that, that could change. We'll see what my schedule allows. Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And they heard the number of the sealed. 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders of the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And this is the gospel of the Lord. All right. Um, this is one of those passages that creates a, dr a great deal of schismatic activity, separation amongst Christians, and even leads to non-Christian sex. I'm thinking... Uh, of the Jehovah's Witnesses at this point. They are not a Christian church, just so you are aware of that. Well, they come knocking on your door. Uh, you may feel obligated or, or you may want to engage them. That's fine. But if you start feeling uncomfortable, just close the door. You know, they're, they're there um, at the behest of Satan to take you away from the Christian faith. So send them to my house, 14 Foxwood Court, Rock Island. Send them over and uh, I'll be happy to talk to them. I've had, I've done that over the years. I've had them sitting in my living room until somebody comes and rescues them because they're never alone, which, okay, I get it. You want them to be safe. And I remember uh, the man using this text, and I just asked him, are, are you one of those? So let, let's unpack this a little bit. So the vision continues. And remember, we're dealing with apocalyptic literature, which is highly symbolic, highly. It's not meant to be, for the most part, to be taken literally. So we get to this number of 144,000. Well, the first clue, Sherlock, that, that this is not, you know, to be taken literally is that, well, it's a multiple of 12. It's kind of a, an interesting number, you know, so 12 times 12. And also, it is the tribes of Israel. And, and, and the second segment of this chapter is after this, I look and behold, then you hear tribes, nations, languages, way beyond these 12 tribes of Israel. So... Um, the, uh, uh, this is not quite the way the Israelites are listed, the 12 tribes in the, in the Old Testament, um, uh, uh, cause you have, uh, um, 
uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, you only have Manasseh, you have, you have, let me see if I can count, Judah. And Judah is the one from, from whom, that's the son of Leah, the one from whom the Savior comes. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ishkar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. So you have Joseph, and usually you have Ephraim and Manasseh listed as Joseph in place of uh, uh, a Levi and Joseph himself, the two sons that rounds out the 12, because the Levites don't get a, 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 uh, an inheritance. So the two sons of Joseph do. So this is slightly different, but the emphasis here is on the one from Messiah comes and the nation of Israel itself. Uh, uh, also, Dan is excluded in place of Manasseh, which is quite interesting. Why? Uh, um, anyway, uh, so uh, you have 12,000, 12,000, 12,000. So we have 144,000 is the total. So it's a multiple of 12, 12 squared. Um, and then you have this next segment, numbers that none uh, could count. So I remember asking this Jehovah's Witness person I, you know, that came in, and I said, well, you know, 144,000. I said, well, you know, is that, how do you know it's you? If it's such a small number, and there's millions of these people, you know, let, let's say there's, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, but it's a pretty big church. Started in, uh, um, I forget where they started, but its roots go back to shortly after the time of the Civil War, and kind of its full flower in the early 20th century. I want to say, uh, 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 I'm, I'm going to botch up the names of some of the key figures, but it's a bizarre, bizarre belief system um, based in Christianity, but it is not a Christian church. Uh, so remember that. Um, yeah, and they arrived that, that there'll only be 144,000 people saved you know, the, with the, the heard the number of the sealed, sealed. Uh, but then, remember, he's speaking specifically of Israel here. Now, why? Now, this is kind of puzzling. Uh, does it have something to do with this remnant that will be saved, perhaps? Because we go on in the next section, again, you know, it's it, it's expanded. It's like it goes way beyond those tribes to every tribe, nation, language, the world. Everybody. Right? And you see this, again, this immense heavenly throne. And all that cannot be numbered. You can't come up with the number 144,000. Keep that in mind if you do want to engage with the Jehovah, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, how do you know it's you? You know, if it's one of the 144,000, if there's only 144,000, how do you know it's you? What a horrible, what a horrible head trip to, to put on people um, without realizing that you know, this is the problem when you, when you start with revelation is, you know, your go-to for your theological questions, which a lot of people like to do, and they get all mixed up or they create these weird, weird things that don't, you know, that don't have no real connection to the rest of Scripture, in the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway, so we turn from that, and that's, you know, that's not where we stop, that, that 144,000. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, way bigger. Than, so, you know, and this is not, you know, him describing the 144,000 in some other way. So like, it's like, okay, after this, I looked, and now I'm seeing this, a great multitude from every nation, from every tribe, from every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, this is where it gets fascinating. It's important for you and me. They're clothed in white robes. When we baptize, um, unless the person's an adult, and it's perfectly fine if they do, uh, but you'll see it even in, in churches that don't believe in the F. Uh, a lot of churches baptize, all Christian churches baptize. Not everybody believes that it's a baptism. Not everybody believes that it's doing anything, which is quite sad. Um, I'm quite wrong. Uh, you know, let me just say something about that. It's been weighing on me for the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, you can't have a foot in two camps. You can't go hang out and uh, um, you know attend the Baptist church. And, and people do this, unfortunately, frequently because they, you know, the Baptist churches, because of the world we live in and, and because of the American context. Are always going to be bigger and do more whiz bang things than we're ever going to do as Lutherans, and their theology is so different than ours that it, the church is going to be. It's going to seem more lively. We're very, we're very, we're much more subdued in our church. We sing hymns. We don't sing songs. We don't have people perform. I mean, we do do some of those things, but it's not the. You know, those are exceptions, not the rule. Those are adornments and not the thing that we do. But people will say to me, "Well, I'm still Luther." No, you're not. 
okay? Let me just say that like that. You are going to a church that doesn't, con and eventually if they haven't asked you, they're going to ask you to re be rebaptized. That'll be your first clue that we don't believe the same thing. They're going to ask you to be rebaptized, so we don't believe that. You're not going to have the sacrament because they deny the presence of Christ in the supper. They, they ignore his words, so they don't have it very frequently. You know, they don't believe that the pastor can actually actually absolve sins in this stead or by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. So your forgiveness is based on what? I don't know what you feel, whatever. Um, uh, and, you know, that you're outside. Anyway, so you, we're not confessing the same things. How you're saved is completely different. Uh, um, how, really, how you view Scripture. We're very conservative. We believe this is the Word of God, but we're not fundamentalists. And that's kind of difficult to unpack. So I'm just going to, just, I want you to hear this, okay? That you... You, you can't sit in the church and say, I'm still Lutheran, and, and do the Baptist things, or vice versa, be a Baptist in our church, and, and, and pretend you're Lutheran, you know, if you just think, you know, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm nuts to talk about baptism, you come and talk to me and say, I don't believe you, and you maybe give me a chance to try to show you from Scripture why we say what we do, but if you don't believe it, then don't lie to those people sitting in the pew, or to yourself, just go to the church that you want to believe in, you know, um, uh, you can't you can't play that game. It's, it, God does not want you to play that game. You, you, you're not being honest with the people you're sitting there with, and you're not being honest with the rest of us. And maybe you're afraid to come and talk to me. I am going to challenge you on it, stuff like that. Well, you're a grown-up, okay? Um, so anyway, I just want to say that, because here, you know, Revelation, we see the heart of it. So we see these people clothed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. And now we, we often, across confessions, you see people dressed in white you know, when they're baptized, uh, whether they're Baptists or Lutherans or infants almost. You don't have to be, it's not required, but infants almost exclusively are baptized um, wearing white in our church. Uh, also, in the ancient church, people were often baptized naked and then dressed in a white robe, but they came up with a much different view of nudity, of course, than we do. Everything's so sexualized in our culture. Um, anyway, so they, they're crying, they're holding palm branches, which is interesting. And they're crying out with a loud voice. And I think about, you know, Palm Sunday. And they're crying out, laying palm branches and other branches and coats and stuff on the road. And they're saying, save us, we pray. Hosanna. Say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And now, because they are, these people are saved, they're holding the same palm branches, which is also a sign of victory. Um, uh, so they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Remember, we, Jesus was introduced in, to us in Revelation as the slaughtered Lamb. That is not the only place that's found in Scripture, of course. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He says it twice. Paul calls him the Passover Lamb. He is killed when the Passover lambs are being slaughtered, etc. So all the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders, those 24 elders, their heavenly beings. And these four living creatures, and they fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and fight, honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. Now notice it's this. So one of these heavenly beings, these elders, comes to him and says, These people that, you know, can't be numbered. They're clothed in white robes. From where have they come? And John says, you know, you can imagine the hands saying, you know, I, I don't know. Now notice this here. These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. That's where you and I are, are sitting right now, wherever you are. This is the tribulation. Maybe, you know, open a newspaper or turn on the news if you don't believe me. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We sing... A portion before we have communion, we do divine service setting for you, which is my favorite divine service. Before we have communion, we sing uh, the offertory. Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Glorious. And that comes from the, 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 the 51st Psalm. After It's a psalm that David composes. After he commits that horrible sin with Bathsheba, gets her pregnant, she's the wife of somebody else, has her husband murdered, so he murders him, and uh, pretend, pretends like everything is going to be hunky-dory. God sends the preacher, in this case Nathan, to him and the prophet, and, and just 
he just preaches this powerful sermon, and David's like, ah, oh. you know, he realizes what he realizes what he's done. He repents, and he writes that psalm. And in it, there's this beautiful language that's found throughout Scripture. You know, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. This language of salvation found throughout Scripture, predominantly in the Psalms, is Isaiah two. Um, is Isaiah also not just chapter two? It's throughout Isaiah is this language of being covered with the righteousness of Christ. So notice here in Revelation, we are washed in the blood of Christ, hence the white robes. I think the robes are made white. So you see the symbolism, that because you're washed in the blood, you, you, you're covered with the symbol of purity, you're covered with the righteousness of Christ. So, from where have they come? So you know, these are those who are coming out of the great tribulation, they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There's this nice, tiny little connecting word that these words are so important in Scripture, or important in English too, therefore. Now, if you remember anything about your grammar school education, maybe high school education, learned about grammar, you know, therefore is a summary word. It, it brings you to a summary, you know, for this reason, thusly, we could say, therefore is a common one. You could say, or so, you know, therefore, uh, God in this way loved the world, so. So we could say, so they are, but see, I'm doing it now. So they are before the throne of God, therefore. So for this reason, it's hard to talk about using the summary words, not that we need to. So what's, what's being communicated here is the reason these people are before the throne. It's because they're washed in the blood of the Lamb. Remember last night, if you were listening, I mentioned about Thomas, and the text was from the end of John, when you know, the doubting Thomas. And I mentioned the, these pathetic sermons. Yeah, I use that word. That that turn that into some. You got to try harder. You got to do better. You got to have better faith. You know, my faith is all over the place. I mean, it's usually quite strong, but I have moments of weakness and doubt, like every other human being. Uh, and I cry out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. We talked about that last night. What Jesus was doing in that text, in that episode with John, it's real history. It actually happened. Is he's pointing them. He's pointing the apostles to where you and I are. It's like, these people aren't going to see, and yet they're going to believe because of the word. Remember, I continue to reading John when he says, these things are written that you may believe. We have the word that tells us what we need to know about the Christ. And actually, God is working through the word. So, for this reason, not because our faith is strong, not because we're better than everybody else, but for this reason, with no qualifiers on, by the way, Simply because we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, we are before the throne of God. That's amazing. And then he wipes the tears from our eyes. All right, it's 822. Um, think about what I said, though. If you have people in your life that are, because you know, this is such a baptismal text. And these churches that, that mistreat baptism and don't teach it, I, I feel so badly for them, for the people in that, because they're, they're never going to know like you know. One, the depth of your sin. They're going to have to hide it from themselves. And two, you know, exactly how they're loved by God. And, and rejoice in the salvation, which is theirs, as a free gift. And that's why we talk the way, at least why I talk the way I do. So if you have people like that in your life, so think about what I said. Maybe play this for them and say, you know, listen, you know, you don't have to, you don't, then you can, don't even have to get involved. Not what you should, but I get it, you know, it's good. A little tongue-tied at times, or maybe we just don't want to seem. I get it. I've been there. But my point is, you you can't stand in both camps. I mean, you got to pick what you believe, and you got to you know give yourself at least the opportunity to study and be taught. Okay. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, tonight I'm, I'm, tonight I'm going to just read the prayer here and then just have a prayer generally for those who are sick. We often name their names, not required. Remember, we are not heard because of our flowery words, because of the eloquence of our verbosity. We are heard because of Christ. So whether my prayers be short or long, whether we name or don't name, and we do like to name for a couple of reasons, God knows, and he hears because of Christ. So we pray for the preaching of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the spread of his knowledge throughout the whole world, for the persecuted and oppressed, for the sick and dying, for those who travel, those who mourn, those who work to protect us. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. Pinch your hands, I commend myself, my body, soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once again, I'm going to turn to we have a couple more nights of this. Tomorrow I'll sing the whole hymn. But 357, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And tonight, the O Antiphon is O King of the Nations, the ruler they long for, the cornerstone uniting all people. Come and save us all whom you form out of clay. What a beautiful antiphonal prayer. You know, we, we long for that one king, don't we, that unites us all. And he's come. And we're waiting for the consummation of that. But, you know, if I may, you know, this is already quite long, but uh, if I may, one of the great joys as a pastor, even just as a, when I was just a layman, and I just did a lot of business traveling. When I would go to a church in Texas or San Diego, I don't often have to travel during the Lent now, but, but uh, more so during the Lent season. And even if I was there, you know, usually often I would go over the weekend and then the first several days or maybe a full week, depending on what I was doing. And you try to find a church and you go into the church and, you know, just, you know, you're one with these people. They, they recognize that you know the liturgy and that you sing with them. It is really an incredible thing. And you are welcome as family. You're welcome as a brother, as you should be, as a brother and sister in Christ. You know, when somebody comes and visits our church, yeah, on Christmas, there's a lot of visitors, so, you know, um, we don't recognize it all that much. Plus, we know a lot of those are family members, but I guess we know them quite quite well. But anybody can come. And, uh, you know, but when we just travel on a regular Sunday, oh, my gosh, you know, we are united. But we're just waiting for the, the kind of restoration of all things. So I'm going to, uh, tomorrow night, if I remember, I'll read them in Latin, too, uh, the names for all these. So, stanza seven, though, from the hymn itself. O come desire of nations, O come desire of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid thou our sad division cease, and be thyself our King of peace. Rejoice, rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. That stands a seven uh, after a bit of a false start there. Uh, o come, O come, Emmanuel, from 357. With that, my brothers and sisters, I bid you a blessed evening. And by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.